Hello, my name is Ron Broussard, and today we're going to talk about lifespan development, chapter nine. So, what we're going to be discussing is the changes that we see, not just physically, but socially and, and mentally throughout our life and our development. Now, it is important for you as an EMT to be very knowledgeable of those changes because then you can incorporate your knowledge of those into patient assessments. Like, how I speak to a three-year-old or a four-year-old is going to be a little different than how I speak to and assess a, say, 15-year-old patient. Or understanding the different challenges, say, for a geriatric patient uh, versus that of a young adult. So I can really bring a lot to the table when it comes to my assessment and my interaction and building a rapport uh, just by having a simple understanding of the different changes that you could see. Now, the first age group that we're going to talk about are neonates and infants. Now, a neonate is from the moment they're born to one month, and an infant carries on from that first month uh, to one year of age, or 12 months. Now, in that time frame, we do see a significant amount of change that occurs in infancy, okay? Just, they grow their size gets they get bigger, okay, but not only that, but even their interaction with the environment changes. Now, here's an example of a nice newborn baby, all right, so you guys just take a look at the picture, you guys can see, you know, okay, this is how this baby looks at birth, and compare that to, now this 12-month-old infant at the end of the infancy period okay we can see a lot of changes like they're up crawling around now they will hold their head up okay and even how they interact with their environment is completely different now now some of the physiological changes that we see now average birth weight is going to be between three to three and a half kilograms and the head accounts for a significant amount of that weight about 25 percent now after birth, uh, weight drops between 5 to 10 percent in those first two weeks, and that could be something that is a little bit concerning for the mom, um, especially if it's, you know, their first baby and, you know, maybe they don't know that. Uh, okay, now physiological changes continued. They're primarily nose breathers until about four weeks of age. Uh, that's why it's important to clear their, their, their nasal passages with, you know, bulb syringe. Uh, so that way uh, they can have a free, unobstructed flow of air because their primary drive is going to be through their nose. Airways easily obstructed, specifically, you know, the, the larynx more funnel shaped, the trachea about the size of a number two pencil. So very small, small objects can easily occlude that. Fewer alveoli, alveoli is where gas exchange occurs. Okay, and then lung tissue is more fragile. So with that fragile lung tissue, we got to be very careful when providing positive pressure ventilations as not to rupture lung tissue. Now, the chest wall is soft with weak accessory muscles. And now we know accessory muscles, uh, those are going to be used primarily when in respiratory distress, all right? And they're not conditioned, so therefore that child can deteriorate quickly due to fatigue. Okay, there we go, fatigue can easily occur from respiratory distress. Again, because we don't have those conditioned muscles. Now. Increased respirations can lead to dehydration and heat loss. Immune system is immature. Immunizations are important. Now, with the immunity uh, in that baby, that's why, you know, breastfeeding uh, can be extremely beneficial as that child can get those immunoglobulins from the mother. But then the immune immunizations, what they do is they help condition the immune system to respond quickly to those, you know, bacteria, the virus, you know, whatever they're getting immunized for, uh, so that their body can quickly respond to and eliminate whatever it is that that illness is um, without it spreading and becoming catastrophic to that child. Now, they do have several important reflexes, uh, like the Moro or startle reflex, the Palmer reflex, where you can put your finger uh, in like a baby's hand and their response is to grab it and they of course pull it to their mouths because that's how they investigate their environment is, you know, can I eat this? Um, and then also they have like the cough or the, the gag reflex where it's like if they do choke on something, they can cough it out. Okay, now they also have like a suckle reflex where like if you uh, trace your finger on like a, a small baby's cheek, uh, they'll turn to that side and uh, attempt to suckle. 
Okay, and then extremity movement should be symmetrical, meaning it should be even on both sides of the body. We shouldn't be seeing a child move on one side and then be completely uh, limp or weak on the other. Now, they do have an inability to localize pain. I feel like everybody understands that, you know, if you come up on an infant that's in pain, odds are they're going to be crying. If you ask a question of, with one finger, point to me where your pain is, I guarantee you they're never going to be able to point to you, uh, point to where their pain is and tell you what's going on. All right. Now they have fontanelles. Fontanelles are the soft spots. Now the posterior fontanelle closes at about three months. The anterior fontanelle closes between nine to 18 months. Now with those fontanelles, we could use those in our assessment. So our assessment, when we look at them, if they're sunken in, could indicate that the child's dehydrated. Uh, if they are raised or bulging, that can happen, you know, while the baby's crying, but it can also happen uh, due to increased intracranial pressure. Now, some of the milestones that we're looking for at two months. A child should be able to track objects with their eyes. Focus on objects 8 to 12 inches away. Recognize familiar faces. Display primary emotions. Okay, recognize familiar sounds and voices, i.e. mom, dad, and then move in response to the stimuli. Now at six months, they should be able to sit upright in a high chair, make one syllable sounds. Now with those sounds that they're making, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a, a definition to that sound to them. Uh, Odds are they're making that noise as um, something that they're repeating or, or mimicking what they're hearing. So like mom, dad, uh, or ma, da. Uh, oftentimes, it's not that they are incorporating that with mom or dad. It's more that mom and dad are sitting there like mama, mama, dada, dada. And then the baby is just mimicking what it is that they're hearing. Okay, now they should be able to support upper body when on stomach, grasp and shake hand toys, follow moving objects with their eyes, and then recognize familiar objects at a distance. Okay, now by 12 months, they should be able to sit without assistance and walk with help. Okay, they should be able to know their own name, crawl and creep on hands and knees, put objects into containers, poke objects with fingers, Respond to simple requests and no, and now say mama and dada, and now there is a, a connection or definition to what they are saying. Now, psychosocial changes. Parents must meet the infant's physical, emotional, and psychological needs for healthy development. Okay. There are different stages of development throughout life. In infancy, um, one that you know, I'm familiar with because they've kind of that's what's really been pushed like in nursing was uh, Erickson's stages of development. Now, during that infancy period, um, the psychosocial change that's occurring there is they develop this trust, mistrust um, with their environment based off of like if their physical, emotional, and psycho psychological needs are being met, okay? If they are being met, then they, okay, have this sense of trust. If they're not being met, then they develop this sense of mistrust. Now, infants do not like to be separated from their caregivers, the ones that meet their needs, and their way to communicate with us is through crying, whether it's they're hungry, whether their diaper is dirty, whether they have gas, whether they're in pain. Okay, that is their way to communicate with us. Now, odds are if you're assessing a baby, which I will tell you guys coming into a scene, like a, a silent house where you're dispatched to a little baby is, it's, it's kind of like nerve wracking. You know, it's like the best thing you can hear is like that cry. Okay, the crying baby is like, they, they have a good airway and they're breathing well. All right. now. When you're assessing that child, if they are crying, look to see, it's like, have they been fed recently? Have they been burped? Is their diaper dirty? Okay, is the environment really cold? Okay, if everything checks out, odds are that baby's in pain and that's why they're crying. Okay, they can detect to and respond to the parent's emotions, so it's very important to keep the caregiver calm, which will help keep the, the child calm. Now, toddlers and preschool age children. So a toddler is between one and three years of age. Preschool, preschooler is between three to six years of age. 
Now, what we see happening during these stages are an increased body mass with decreased uh, body fat. So that's where they start to shed that baby fat, um, start to lose those little Michelin tire man type appearance. Okay, primary teeth have merged, uh, increased number of alveoli in the lungs, making respirations a bit more effective, loss of passive immunity, okay, that's what they're getting, you know, from mom, okay, but then they start to gain active immunity from the environment, um, you know, through exposure, okay, brain and motor skills do develop quite quickly here. Now, those three-year milestones that we're looking for is they're able to walk alone and begin to run. Okay, pull or carry several toys when walking, climb up and down furniture or sta stairs with minimal support, scribble and play with toys, find hidden objects, okay, and sort objects by shape and or color. Now, the one thing I'll say here is they, stu they do develop uh, object permanence, okay, they should have developed that by this point. Now, what we're talking about here is... Uh, you know, the game of peekaboo, for example, you know, you hide from a little baby uh, and they can't see you. It's like, well, they think you're gone. Whereas, you know, by three years old, okay, peekaboo should have worn out. Okay. It's no longer fresh and new. Okay. That kid knows you're behind the blanket. All right. If you cover their toy with something, they know that that toy is underneath that blanket uh, versus you cover it when they're younger, you know, they a toy's gone forever now, you know, so they should have object permanence have developed by this, uh, by this age. Okay, now, five-year milestones, stand on one foot for more than 10 seconds, hop, jump, swing, climb, and do somersaults, dress and undress without assistance, count 10 or more objects, and trace and draw pictures. So these are things that we're looking for them to accomplish by this age. Now, psychosocial changes. We do start to see language develop here. Uh, we see separation anxiety at about 18 months. Now, this is when they're separated from their caregiver. They don't like to be separated. Now, playtime helps with social skills. Now, Always, always, always ensure that when you are interacting with a toddler or a preschooler, you are talking at their level, okay? Talk to them in words that they can understand, okay? You're going to come in there with your med bag, your stethoscope, your blood pressure cup, all this stuff, and it can be very overwhelming. And then you talk to them about how it's like, I'm going to take your blood pressure with my blood pressure cuff and I'm going to measure with a sphincter and I'm going to use my stethoscope to hear the pulse of them. That kid's going to be so overwhelmed by what you're saying. You know, it's going to cause some anxiety for him. You know, especially I'm going to, you're going to take his blood pressure. It's like, wait a minute, that's my blood pressure. They're going to have like these concrete thoughts. Like, don't take that from me. That's mine. I'm going to measure your blood pressure. Okay. I'm going to listen to your heartbeats. All right. Use like simple words that they can understand okay and now always let them touch the equipment before you use it you know a good thing too is you know watch them uh allow them to watch you use it on like mom or dad um to show that it's like it's not going to hurt them uh, and that can do a lot to help lower their anxiety with the call okay school age children uh this is between six and 12 years of age all right we see significant changes here look at kobe bryant now all right. Now, some of the things that we see, bones increase in density and grow large. Primary teeth are replaced with permanent teeth, able to read and write. Now, we do still see nocturnal enuresis. Okay, nocturnal enuresis simply means bedwetting. That way may continue after the age of 10. All right, it's something that they may be ashamed of. Okay, but it can continue. So let them know it's like, it's okay. So social changes, friendships are important. Now, friendships during school age generally tend to occur with uh, the same sex. So uh, where these friendships are going to be male, male, okay, female, female, you know, and then the opposite sex, you know, like I'm sure you can all think about your childhood where it's like, oh, girls have the cooties or boys have the cooties or whatever. Uh, but in school age, those friendships are made with primarily the same sex. Okay, now problem solving skills develop, and they also start to develop a self concept, self esteem, and morals develop. 
And this generally is going to occur from those around them that they look to, like a mom, dad, okay, or even their, their close friends. All right, now, increased understanding of pain, illness, injury, and death. <clears throat> so they do understand, you know, the, the permanent nature of death. Okay, they do understand their illness and injury, whereas those preschool age, they may think an injury is their fault, uh, you know, not so much in our school age children, uh, but they can still be uh, traumatic for them. So we always want to make sure for school age and younger kids that we cover up any injuries because it can help reduce anxiety. All right, now adolescence, this is uh, 12 to 18 years of age. All right, so in a sense, our, our teenagers here. Now, we do see a uh, two to three year growth spurt here. Generally speaking, uh, females will hit this before males. Uh, girls do finish growing by age 16, boys by age 18. Now, this is just a uh, textbook in nature. It can be different for everybody. I've read textbooks that have said that adolescence and the adolescent period ends technically when the individual stops growing. Uh, but uh, again, this is just textbook, so with these numbers, just take them kind of with a grain of salt. Now, puberty and reproductive maturity occur. So this is where our, the primary sex glands in the male and the female, male being the testes, female being the ovaries, uh, start to release their sex hormones. So with males being testosterone, with females being estrogen and progesterone. Okay, with females, we see uh, menses, okay, the first you know, menstrual period. Okay, and then with males, uh, that's where we see a lot of behavioral changes due to testosterone. So we see, you know, more, uh, don't want to say reckless, but more aggressive type uh, behaviors. Now, psychosocial changes. Now, changes can result in family conflict. Now, a big thing here, again, kind of going back to Erickson, uh, in this stage, we see, you know, identity versus uh, role confusion. Now, this is, in this stage, they're developing their own sense of who they are. This is kind of where they start to break away now from mom and dad uh, and start to create their own path. And now that can cause some family issues. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody can think back to their childhood and they probably had a different opinion than their mom and dad did for how they were when they were a teenager. And of course, when you were a teenager, you thought you were 100% right 100% of the time. Uh, so there can be a lot of conflicts that occur here. Now, they do believe they are the focus of others' attention and have feelings of invulnerability. So first, let's take that focus of others' attention. Uh, in this stage, they may feel like everybody's looking at them, like the focus is always on me when, you know, in a sense, it's not the case. Like, no, not, everybody's not looking at you right now, even though they may feel like they're constantly under that. You know, it's like, oh, well, everybody's watching me. You know, it's like not the case. Now, they have this feeling of invulnerability, like they, they can't be hurt, um, like they're you know, kind of invincible at this point. Uh, so we do see a lot of reckless behaviors. That's where we start to see, uh, you know, engaging in alcohol, drug use, smoking. Uh, we'll just take driving behind the wheel of a vehicle, speeding, uh, and texting and driving. We see that, you know, a lot more at a younger age, you know, in our teenagers versus, you know, you don't see, you know, the grandpa, you know, texting and driving while he's going down the road. Okay, desire to be treated as adults. However, we need to recognize that legally they cannot make decisions about their health care. We still need to get consent from the parents. All right, and privacy is very important to them. Now, experiment, uh, experimentation with alternate identities, kind of hit on that already, where they're trying to find out who they are. Now, understand there are consequences for actions, may engage in self destructive behaviors. Now, depression and suicide do increase within this age group. We see it very high uh, in adolescence, and then we also see it peak again uh, in later adulthood. Um, now, with um, those self-destructive behaviors, that's what we talked about in the previous slide, um, alcohol use, smoking, okay, and drug use. 
okay? Concern with their body image, things like scarring from an injury, okay, is going to be of major concern for them and then may engage in sexual behavior. And now another concern too is, okay, self-destructive behaviors and then uh, sexual behaviors. Uh, this can be an issue. I, uh, the, the statistics for STDs right now are are concerning. You know, I think it's like one in four uh, have you know a, an STD. Um, so when they're going out and they're engaging in these behaviors, I'm, I'm sure they're not going through this like, whoa, have they had a blood test recently? Have they, you know, it's like, do we have protection? like how many sexual partners have they had they're probably not going through the like that whole thought process in their mind before they're engaging in the act um which again opens them up to uh to sickness all right early adulthood so this is age uh 20 to 40. now some of the physiological changes optimum function of body systems which we see a peak at about 26 years of age all right, accidents are going to be the leading cause of death for this age group. Accidents will be the leading cause of death for this age group. Now, some of the psychosocial changes that you see uh, is this increased responsibility and independence. In a sense, we are breaking away from, you know, like high school and now we're going off to college, we're getting our first job, and we're starting to make a career and then start our own family. So we're being responsible, being independent, creating our own life, okay? Now, beginning careers carry a high level of job stress. The one great aspect of this is our body is at its peak, in a sense, in early adulthood. So we can adequately adapt to that high level of stress. Okay, take that to say, this is why they say it's so much harder for an older adult to have a career change because oftentimes it's very competitive. That higher level of stress has uh, more impact on them physically. Now, middle adulthood, some of the physiological changes is we see a decline. Uh, I was told in the class that I took that there is 1% decline in certain organ function for every year past 30. And, you know, like, man, I'm, I'm already losing them. I've lost like 5% so far. That's not good. All right. But uh, we also see uh, issues with chronic diseases in middle adulthood. Okay. So this is 40 to 60. Now, with chronic diseases, what we're talking about here is going to be like type 2 diabetes, although it is creeping up on early adulthood, okay, but type 2 diabetes. Another big one is cancer, okay? Cancers start to really show up in middle adulthood. Now, we see weight gain occurring, okay, vision changes. Now, women undergo menopause in their late 40s to 50s. Now, the one thing here is, guys, you see this on one of our tests, it's like, uh, menopause is a, a normal uh, life change, okay, that is expected in every female, all right, just like puberty is something that you expect in every teenager. Um, so if, if you guys see it on a test, I don't know why people pick this, but uh, if it asks you about, like, um, the greatest health risk to middle adulthood uh, people, please don't pick menopause. Uh, odds are it's probably going to be along the lines of a chronic disease like type 2 diabetes or cancer or, you know, something along those lines, all right? Like, I mean, if you just compare those cancer to menopause, like, they don't even compare to me, but I, I do see a lot of people struggle with that question. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Now, psychosocial changes. Now, problems are seen more as challenges versus threats, okay? Meaning a challenge, like, okay, this is hard but i can overcome this versus this is a threat to me uh, and now i have kind of a, a fight or flight type reaction to it okay more developed coping skills aware of time limits okay focused on others rather than themselves okay and then transitions in parenting so at this point with uh with middle adulthood you start to see like that an empty nest type deal where now their kids are moving out and moving away and that transition comes where now they focus on their own parents who are now getting 
in you know, late adulthood and maybe now they need supportive care. So they're transitioning to taking care of their parents versus taking care of their kids. Now, late adulthood. Now, this is going to be age 61 to, you know, to death. All right. Their health and their vital signs greatly depend on how well they took care of themselves uh, and their underlying you know, conditions uh, in late adulthood. All right. So if they weren't a smoker. If they had a healthy diet, if they're of a healthy weight, all right, you know, they're going to have, you know, the normal vital signs that we would probably see for middle and early adulthood. Compare that to somebody who's been smoking since they were 14, all right, they're probably going to have a higher respiratory rate. They're going to have a low oxygen saturation uh, just because that's what they've done to their, to their body over time. Now. Some of the physiological changes that we see in late adulthood um, with maximum lifespan uh, is about 120 years. All right. So that's the longest time that, you know, a cell can live. All right. Now, life expectancy varies with year of birth. So uh, I think right now we're looking at about 70, I want to say 77, 78 for average life expectancy right now. All right, so it does depend on uh, what year you were born. Uh, so life expectancy kind of fluctuates up and down. Uh, but you can look at healthy people. I think it's 2020, which we'll talk about the uh, like average life expectancy for people born now. Uh, you can look at that. That's not a, an exam type question. But if you were interested, you could research it there. Healthy people 2020. Okay, we do see incidence of diseases increase here. And cardiovascular systems changes uh, with an increase in myocardial workload. All right, so heart, you know, unfortunately, we do see hypertension and, uh, you know, late adulthood. Now, the heart has to work harder to overcome those higher pressures. All right, and so we do see more stress being put on the heart. All right, the brain becomes smaller with some neuron loss. Now, with the brain shrinking, more space is taken up by cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, we may see memory problems and a disruption in sleep cycle. So we see that more sleeping more during the day, taking more naps throughout the day, uh, and then waking up really early or not being able to sleep very well at night. We do see a decreased reaction time which opens them up to if they're still driving, uh, you know, traffic collisions, okay, and also falls in the household. Now, respiratory systems change with a diminished ability to cough. We see decreased lung capacity, and we do start to see diminishing gas exchange. So we can see, you know, a little bit more higher respiratory rates in our older population. Now, with uh, the decreased ability to generate a good strong cough that's also why we see uh, an increase in like say pneumonia in the geriatric population now diminished smell taste hearing and vision do occur diminished pain perception and kinesthetic sense so kinesthetic sense is just kind of an awareness of where their body is in space okay so like if you closed your eyes and you had like a glass you know, on the counter, like you could probably move to that glass without directly looking at it. All right. Um, but also not just that, but where their feet are. So like stairs may be a challenge for them. It may be a trip hazard. Okay. We see a lot more shuffle steps. Okay. With our older patients. Okay. We do see issues with falls. Also issues with hydration and nutrition. Why? Because food doesn't taste as good. All right, food doesn't taste as good, doesn't smell as good, so there's not that desire to eat it. But we also see a poor absorption of the nutrients that they do take in. You know, my grandma, the one thing, like she was tiny um, before she passed, and she had very particular taste about what she would eat. She would like throw down cheesecake and ice cream, and she wouldn't gain a pound. Uh, you know, and it was just like her body just couldn't take in the nutrients from the food that she was eating. So we do see changes in ability to communicate, mainly due to uh, hearing issues, which can affect speech. And then health status varies widely, you know, and we'll kind of talk about it with psychosocial, but 
we can't just assume that they're going to have problems because of their age. We can't just say, well, you are 80, you know, and that's why this is happening. Because if the person has taken care of themselves and they've made good choices with their diet and not smoked and exercise and all that good stuff, uh, then, you know, the system should still be working somewhat. We can't just attribute everything to their age. So into those psychosocial changes. Now, they may be satisfied with the outcome of their life, or they may have regrets that lead to depression. Now, with that, uh, I had a, a psych teacher when I was in college that, you know, told us that she had a lot of patients that she interacted with that were older. And she said, uh, every uh, thing that I picked up was people regretted what they didn't do versus what they did. Um, you know, and so a lot of people will look back and reflect. And when they look back and reflect, it's oftentimes going to be about, it's like, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have taken the time to do this, you know, and that those regrets can be overwhelming. Now, there are feelings of isolation that may occur. The number one uh, stressor in life is going to be the loss of a spouse. Now, imagine you spend your entire life with somebody, you know, 50 years, because we're talking about late adulthood, 60 years, you know, you're at the retirement age, you sit at the table with that person, and that's how y'all spend your day. You know, we sit at the kitchen table, and we talk about, you know, the news or whatever it is that they like to talk about, and that person passes. Well, that has been like their entire life for, you know, the last 50 or 60 years, and now they don't have that anymore. So... It can be extremely depressing, and that is why also suicide is high in our the older patients. Now, we see financial difficulties that can occur. Uh, a big reason for that is because they may have to leave a house that is paid off uh, where they've been living on a fixed income, and they might have to go into an expensive assisted living or skilled nursing facility, which is not cheap uh, and those costs you know oftentimes can be absorbed by you know the the kids uh, to help pay for those you know care that they need uh, but it can be expensive for them and it can cause an issue with finances especially at older age they do live on fixed income now we see decreased uh, independence can affect feelings of well-being Okay, imagine you're somebody who's driven your entire life and they decide, you know, because your vision's bad or because, you know, whatever medical condition that you have, that it's like they're going to take your driver's license away. So now you can't go to the grocery store for yourself anymore. You know, it can affect your well-being, like everything that you used to do for yourself, just being able to, to wipe yourself after you've had a bowel movement. Being able to dress yourself. Imagine like being aware of your loss in ability and what that would do for your, your self-worth. Okay. Now, oftentimes too at this age, there is this fear of losing independence and they won't be as forthcoming with things. You know, maybe they had an interaction with their, their you know, their adult child that was you know it's like you know mom dad if you fall again we will have to we will we'll need to put you in you know an assisted care facility and now they have to leave the home that they've been in for a long time and so you get called out and maybe they're reluctant to tell you about a fall that they've had you know so understand that their lack of honesty isn't to deceive you it's more out of a concern that they're going to lose their independence or what independence they still have Okay, and that concludes chapter 90. Thank you.